Hello and welcome to this video from Boulder Bach Festival. Today we'll explore the notation of Johann Sebastian Bach's keyboard music. If we start to examine the music of Bach's contemporaries and the composers that came before him all around Europe, we see a lot of diversity in the notational practices. By the mid-18th century, notation was becoming more standardized, but throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, there were many more customs. The Virginalist school in England largely used two six-line staves with G and C clefs. The French used two five-line staves, as we still do today, but used a different system of rhythm in their unmeasured preludes. This was very helpful in showing the subtle colorations and gestures that defined the playing style. The Italians used two systems of keyboard notation throughout the 17th century. There was the closed, or intervallatura scores, with a six-line G or C clef for the right hand and an eight-line combined clef for the left hand. These were used in styles that were more improvisatory and virtuosic. The second system was the open partitura scores. These resemble modern four-part open scores, but are not aligned vertically. These systems were used when writing polyphonic music such as canzoni, ricercari, fantasia, capricci, and fugues. This is where we bring Bach into the story. In his Art of Fugue, written in the last decades of his life, he used the partitura system. This doesn't indicate that it should be played on four separate instruments, although this can be done with great success. Rather, it harkens back to the great polyphonic composers of the past. Studying or playing from this score can yield a clearer understanding of the independence of each voice within the full texture. See the clefs he uses here? To play from this score, we need to read four different clefs. We have our usual bass F4 clef, the tenor C4 clef, the alto C3 clef, and the soprano C1 clef. In his Klavierbuchlein für Wilhelm Friedemann Bach, J.S. lays out the different foundational elements of a notation in one place. Some other clefs in this page that he shows are the mezzo-soprano clef and two other F-based clefs. Bach also wrote a table to show how to execute the different ornament symbols written above notes. Here is a little prelude that appears early on in the book. The left hand employs many of these ornaments in quick succession. This also shows how important the bass voice was in the understanding of Bach's music. The next example we'll look at is a fantasia near the end of the Wilhelm Friedemann notebook. Both in the original manuscript and Johann Christian's edition, there are no notated ornaments, just the three-part trio sonata texture. But when J.S. compiled the two-part inventions and three-part symphonias as a separate set, he added profuse ornamentation that transforms the music with a rich interweaving of suspensions and embellishments.
This is an interesting occurrence because it opens up the possibility of adding ornaments according to the player's taste in other situations. Next, I want to discuss the notation of some rhythms that are not exactly clear according to modern understanding. The context of the piece within a genre of song or dance might lead us to reinterpret certain rhythms. The first we'll look at is the dot. In modern notation, the dot placed after a given note value will add 50% of length in all situations. But in box time, it was a little more variable and could lengthen the value much more. Particularly in the overture style, the long notes become longer and the short notes shorter. Today, we could show this idea using a double dot after the note. But this was not used until Leopold Mozart in the next generation. We'll look at an instance in the opening of the C minor partita from Bach's Klavierübung. First, I'll play it using today's literal understanding of rhythm. But if I interpret the dots as longer and the pickup notes as shorter, we get this. The next topic is duple and triple subdivisions of the beat. Usually this is quite clear, but sometimes Bach combines both and either we play literally or one wins out and transforms the other. In the E minor partita, the tempo di gavotta starts with a subdivision of the beat in two. A few bars later, he uses a subdivision of three in the right hand and four in the left hand. Here's how this sounds played literally. A few measures in and we find a striking juxtaposition of these two subdivisions. There is another way of reading this where the 16th note bends to the will of the triplets and becomes a so-called square triplet. This unifies the subdivisions and results in a more dance-like flow that fits well in the suite and genre of Gavotta. Lastly, I wanted to discuss how Bach scholars think he notated his temperament. This scribble on the cover page of the Well-Tempered Clavier has been interpreted as his system of tuning to be employed for the Well-Tempered approach. The squiggles indicate how many beats a second the fifths are tempered. The result is a circular tuning with access to all keys, but different flavors and colors for each key. Bach left us some puzzles to solve and different ways of approaching his music on the page. 
The music is brought to life when we can extract the meaning of the notation and explore the subtle possibilities available. Thank you so much for watching this offering from Boulder Bach Festival.